Really, I'm going to go back to when I said I was 11 and I drank wine coolers. So keep that in mind. Wine coolers at the age of 11. It didn't make sense till later. But even though I had my son and I wanted this house, that didn't mean everything was beautiful. I still was still smoke weed myself. I still wasn't able to be in a relationship with my son's father that was healthy. I was a very dominant female very aggressive, very angry because I dealt with my trauma with my mom, the stuff I witnessed with my father. Then I had a, I was a victim of abuse myself at 11. I'm not going to go in detail about that. These things were never resolved. So even though I was a parent to Arthur, I was a broken parent. I wasn't solid. Mm. Even though I had hopes and dreams that he can be in a home and that he can have this dog and that he can be in a stable environment, I was still a broken mom that was just hustling to make it his way legally for him to have these things. But I still didn't deal with my inner trauma. So I still self-medicated myself and smoked weed. Me and my son's dad would fight a lot. Um, we would argue a lot. I did unhealthy things in my relationship with him by not being faithful to him by dipping out on him and running to different guys, doing things that weren't appropriate because I was never modeled a solid relationship. Remember my dad always showed me five and six women, respect none, get what he can get from them and keep on to the next. It was never modeled to me. And I always had the message from him, don't never let no guy treat you any type of way. You do what you need to do. But it seemed like it all boiled down to that broken person trying to make an unbroken relationship just didn't turn out right. That's right. And it's in, absolutely right. And, and, and in this brokenness, when, when the healing or when the good things were coming, is it, is it okay to say you didn't even understand goodness? You didn't really understand love. You really didn't even understand what all was, how you've been blessed at that time. Exactly. Because I was never modeled. It was never taught. And I never understood because all the women that I saw love somebody was dominated and beat down by my father to nothing. They would cry. They would hurt. They would ask him why. Why would you do them like that? Why would I want to love somebody if that's the reward, to be mistreated? I always use, I used to think of the word love with mistreatment. Love would be pushed over. Love would be dominated by a man. Love would disrespect. I never thought about love the way God wants us to understand love until now. Mm. Until now. Mm -hmm. So love to me meant pain and hurt and misery. So I couldn't love my son's dad correctly because I didn't love myself and even know what love really meant. 
This is a man, a young man that came from a Christian foundation from two parents that are still married to this day. Two parents that had three kids. The father is a pastor and the mom, she tried even though she was off as all get out, but the, he still came from a background that was solid, right? Right. Where his parents demonstrated love, his parents demonstrated work together, parents demonstrated unity in their marriage and family. I didn't ever have that. My mom, she's been married three times herself. Me and my mom, when I was young, had a broken relationship. What was there to look up to, right? And so even though I had a blessing, I didn't know how to respect and honor the blessing. Mm -hmm. Because when you're looking at your life through broken lens, you'll never look at it correctly. It's looking at it cracked, right? Right. And that's where I was in my early 20s. I didn't even know better. So it's somewhat like self-sabotage. I didn't feel like I was good enough to have these things, but on the on the front side, I was good enough to have my home. I was good enough to have the dog. I was good enough to have the house decorated because what did my dad do? Everything we had materially looked great, but the inside of the souls were broken. As I look back now, all this is in preparation to where I am today and I'm thankful for it. I've dealt with all this stuff. And I'm thankful for it, but as I'm talking about it, it still makes you think like, wow, you know? The wow in it is how he carried you through that. You know, That's how, right. how it could, like you were saying earlier, you could have died. You could have been mm -hmm. OD'd somewhere. You, could, you mm -hmm. could literally be strung out today. Today. But wow. He carried wow. you through this. And, and I know we haven't even got to the rest of it yet because you're just, you're still at home. And you said you was tripping a little bit because you didn't understand love. To you, love nope. was negative. You know, love, yes. had a, love, love didn't look like this in your head. Love was abusive, mm -hmm. lying, cheating. And, and, mm -hmm. and love was just a word that had yeah. Not too much meaning. And here mm -hmm. you are with the kid in Denver at your aunt. What <laughs> happened after that? I'm glad you mentioned, because I don't know if you remember earlier when I mentioned, part of my story is also telling you how for so long the devil was trying to chase me. Ever since I've been here, he's been trying to chase me to fight, to not make it. But the grace of God, all through this, he was holding my hand. Yes. That's why I could say, wow, like you said, you didn't ever hear me say, well, it's me. I was not worthy. I'm this victim. I'm a fallout. No, I'm saying like, wow, I'm going to still keep grinding and pushing. I, I don't understand these things, but I'm going to still keep going. I'm going to get my cosmetology. I'm going to get this kid this home. I'm going to get these things. I'm going to try to my best to put some type of stability and structure into this madness. Okay. I didn't have time to fall back because he needed me. My son, I didn't get to fall back. I had to keep pushing forward. I didn't get to fall back. This child needed me, right? right. So by the time he was two and a half, me and Big Arthur broke up. What caused you all to break up? Is that another me, story? Me. Well, again, remember I told you earlier I didn't understand about committed yeah. relationships. And oh, you you relationships. said a lot. You said you yeah, honestly yeah. admitted to messing, going out. Yeah, doing things that had no business, being selfish, right? So we came to the point that it was toxic and wasn't healthy. And, and and I honor this man to this day about this part. I don't care for the man to this day, but I honor what he did. So what he did is he signed the deed over the house to me because it was in both of our names. He said, I'm going to put the deed, I'm going to do a quick claims deed. Here's the home. And I'm going to take the car and I'm going back to Texas. I'll take Arthur for six months. You keep Arthur for six months. And that man left. He was broken. I'm broken, but he left me with a home. See, you know, that's when I should learn about what a real man is about right there. It's like listening to a woman clone of some stuff I went through. When I went through, <laughs> when I went through that, that's exactly what I did. I just quick deed it to home over. I just mm -hmm. said, I'm out of this because it was just too toxic. 
Mm -hmm. Somebody was going to get hurt. Hurt. When you when you live in a toxic relationship, people can get killed. You see it yes. all the time. Okay. People can get you can die. People can kill themselves. Really, let's be real. They can. People can also get so deep into drugs and alcohol where they get lost, where they're gone. Our 22 years old self said, we got to break peace. Dude, you go your way, girl, you go your way. Here's a home for you and my boy. I'll take the car and I'll keep our son six months. You keep him six months. And that's where it left. Arthur went to, my son went to Texas with his grandparents and father because the dad moved back home with his parents to get on his feet. That allowed me, I was working, doing hair. You know, I had my license and I started working on myself slowly, finding myself. You know, I didn't have my kid. I didn't have the pressure of my kids. So I was able to save my money and kind of get myself more organized and focus on my job and start working on me. I thought I wanted to go into criminology and do criminal justice. So I started taking classes at the Community College of Aurora for two years, but I wasn't ready and I didn't finish and that's okay. I end up in another relationship um, with with the gentleman that I was with for a long time, on and off, on and off, which wasn't healthy again. You know, just going through some of the trials and tribulations, because again, I still didn't understand this thing about love and, and these relationships. It was just too much. My son was in the second grade. He ended up staying with me from second grade on and then go with dad in the summer. So I got my son into sports. We were doing sports year round. I started getting him into community activities, getting back into my son. My son started telling mom, I'm lonely. I'm like, lonely? He said, I'm lonely, mom. It's just me and you, I'm lonely. And we had two extra rooms. And one of my clients, I never, never forget her, her name was Precious Soul. She was a foster mom. And I always said, when I got myself together, I'm gonna be a foster mom. I said it, I'm gonna be a foster mom because I know what a foster home needs to look like and be like, I'm gonna be one of them one day. I was 26 years old at this time, worked on some stuff, getting, you know, lived a better stable life. And she was like, I'm a foster mom. She was a nurse and she was a foster mom. I said, I always wanted to do a foster home. I said, you know, I just have my son, he's eight. And I said, and we have two extra rooms in our home. I want to do it. She said, you do? I said, yeah. So I called the agency at the time was Adoption Alliance. I signed up, went through the classes, went through the training. I was the youngest person in my agency, 26 years old, single mom, and I became a foster parent, the only boys at the time. That was 2001. And so what I always wanted to do with the kids was bring them in an environment. I let them call me auntie because I didn't want to never take the role of someone's mom because that word is too big. And that in some kids' case, the word mom and dad is trauma because that's why they're there. But I'd rather be an aunt, like a figure that they can do. Like I'm part of your family, but you're not taking over. So I, I brought them in my home. I did all boys for the longest. And then um, I think three years later, we did a, started doing girl boy split. And I remember they called me for a girl. And I was like, no, I don't take girls. I don't want girls. I'm not into girls. And they said, please, we need a home. And then I took that girl and then I started, I, we, we left that home, got another home. That's where we're at now, um, where my house was divided enough where I could put the girls up here and the boys down there. So they were split. And I raised all the kids to always be family. We're cousins, we're family. We, we you know, so there was never nothing inappropriate. And I raised these kids as my own, as the auntie. We, we went like a few years down the road, but just, I know, you did know. <laughs> yeah, just to clarify, where were you at? I heard you say you started to work on yourself. Um, yeah. And I know you were saying self-medicate and, and I know oh, that okay. you mentioned weed, but mm -hmm. usually when I hear you do one, you might do some mail, you know, you might do a few things. Where, where were you at? emotionally as Ayana and this foster mother when you started bringing these children into your home? Okay, so we'll go back to, because I did skip. So going back to when I was self-medicating, that's when I did used to drink and then I did used to smoke, but it wasn't like 
over the top. But sometimes you just chill out, numb out, get the get those noises and 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 those little things in your head. You just, just kind of numb wait, them wait, out. Wait, right? wait, 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 wait. Yeah, I didn't hear nothing about that. Noises <laughs> and voices. And, wait. When I when I say this, so when you live okay. a life of chaos, sometimes you get these things in your head that okay you're not worthy or you don't deserve this okay. or this relationship. You don't need that. Or again, love is hateful. Love is, is, is hurt. You get these little negative okay. thoughts in your mind. So sometimes, yeah, okay. I'll have a little cocktail or smoke a little bit just to chill out. Just like, just to calm my mind, which is not the way, but that's what I did, you know, okay. but no, I never went. So one thing about me, I never, ever um, used anything outside of, alcohol or marijuana because of my father i if i have even a surgery you can only give me a pain pill for two days i do not mess with certain things because i do believe and a lot of people are in denial about this alcoholism substance abuse is genetic mental health is genetic it's passed down my father's dad was an alcoholic my dad um, was a uh, substance abuse user my great-grandfather was an alcoholic these things are passed down. So you're more prone to these things. Mm -hmm. And if you don't check yourself, you get into some of these things, you may not come out. No, I never used anything like that because mm -mm, I watched my father. Having a parent on drugs to the point where you see them paranoid and they're looking out the window and they're scratching their body and they go to sleep for two and three days and wake up like a monster and then go missing and don't take care of themselves. That's a, that's a nightmare in itself. And there's parts of my dad, a lot of his stories out of respect to him that I haven't said and I'm not. I hear you. Because I've said enough. But there's parts of him that I witnessed. When you talk about substance abuse, and I don't mind sharing this one, but it's, it's horrific. And I mentioned my stepmom earlier, B. I met B when I was eight years old. And she's a good stand-up lady. And my father was on one of these episodes and sometimes when he would come down from an episode, he'd get real depressed. And um, he was living with this lady at the time, one of his women. And he went in the closet with a gun. And my grandfather, I called my great-grandfather over there, called his lady over there, nobody couldn't get him out. And my stepmom lived three blocks down. They were dealing at that time. And it was dark and I ran in the dark to get her. And she came, she got him out the closet. So when you witness uh, a parent that is so strung out like that, that's a tragic thing and a tra traumatic thing. And you witness times that your parent didn't want to live and you were a child to see that, that can mess you up. It can really mess you up. Was that my father? No. To be honest, when you're under the influence, that's nothing but a spirit. You're not yourself. You're under the influence of poison. You're under the influence of a controlled substance and you're not yourself. People don't realize alcohol is the same way. Marijuana is the same way. Pills are the same way. These things will capture your mind. And that's when the devil can really get into your soul where he can make you think, you don't need to live. You're really not worthy. Keep getting high, spin up your money. Who cares if your kids can eat? Who cares if you go home? Who cares who you hurt? When you have the kids come in to the home, boys and girls, mm -hmm. when do you feel in your life mm -hmm. that you, when you started getting a handle of your purpose and your worth, 25. When I was 25, when I was at the, you know, doing hair, doing clients, like I said, I was stable, kept my son into sports. I really, at that time, really leaned into my son, being involved in his school, making sure he was solid. So those things kept me busy, gave me a purpose, you know? We had different activities, fundraisers. So I was focused on my job and my child. And this is one thing parents need to remember when we focus on our kids, we don't have time for some of that other noise because we're focused on our kids' development helping our kids get stable, involving them in activities. And that gives you a sense of joy. 
I knew at 21, I couldn't be someone's foster mom. I knew at 22, I couldn't be a foster mom. I knew at 24, I couldn't be a foster mom. I had to work on myself. I was going to church. I forgot to let that out. We would go to church. I was getting involved in different things, reading the Bible, learning about God, who he was. At times I would doubt God. I'm not going to get you wrong because there were some things like, why did I have to go through some of these things? But at the same time, I was like, wow. Okay, well, this is for this. There's a purpose in there. There's a reason for this. So it wasn't like I was living at the 26 mark in a self-destructive way. You know, by that time, I moved to the house I'm at now. I skipped. By the time I was 26, I purchased my third home. So I left my first home that he gave to me. We stayed there after he signed over the deed. For five years, me and my son, we moved to a different home in the back of Montbello, stayed there for a year and a half, and we flipped that home, me and my son came up here. So my life was more in order. By this time, I decided also to start going to college at Metro University. So I had other things going on. I was a foster mom. I was doing hair, raising other kids, going to college, end up getting my bachelor's in uh, human service, at-risk use for ch- kids and got my bachelor's degree there um and so I was just more into about helping others helping them heal I remember some kids would come into the home that they had to stay and they said you don't know what it's like to be in a foster home I said oh really yes I do well how would you know and I would tell them some of my story and they said but our home is not like a foster home I said that's why you're not allowed to call me your foster mom I'm your auntie that's why I don't introduce you to the community as my foster kids. You're my nieces and nephews. That's why I don't let people know that we run a foster home. This isn't a business. This is a family. Oh. I had kids that were Latino, white, black, and I never allowed them to feel that they were in this business environment because that's what I was used at as a check. The difference when I started doing foster care, the difference, and I'm thankful, caseworkers do come in our home. There's CASA workers. There's GALs. When I was in foster care, you got dropped off and you was thought, that's all. Nobody followed up. There's paperwork that I have to do monthly. There's different interventions I need to go see about these kids in school. There's different things that now I raise older kids, but I help them with independent living and job readiness. You know, there's different things that I have to do to be accountable. And I sleep well at night because I don't have to worry about God wondering what kind of foster home I run. I do the best I can because I'm helping his kids, not for something in return because it's the right thing to do. Amen. I love what I do. Amen. I so, love- so you're still doing this? Yeah. And you've been here and you've seen some of my kids, but you wouldn't know. I wouldn't. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying. You still do this? Because I did not. I've been over there a couple of times and I promise you, not one time ever did I think that those are foster kids or I didn't think no, I thought they were your kids, really. They are. Okay, and so there nobody, you go. Oh, nobody knows. And and to be honest, so from two thousand one to two thousand ten I did domestic care where I did um boys at first, then I did girl boy splits, then I did teen moms, I did kids that came out of juvenile hall, kids that came out of residential. Well in two thousand nine, when you talk about working on yourself is when I met my husband. But before I met my husband, I talked to God for the first time in my life. And I said, God, as I look back at my relationships, I want to do something different. I'm coming to you and I'm asking you for my man and I want him to have these qualities, God. I want him to be a man of God. I want him to be about family. I want him to be about kids. I want him to be about good worth ethics. I want him to be about loving me, building a business and building something. So in 2009, I wrote it down on paper. Three months later, I met my husband and it was funny because I said, this time, God, I don't even want to meet a black American. He has to be Dominican, Puerto Rican, or Jamaican. Well, you you get specific, but that's the way to talk to God. You know, you might as well ask for what you want. Specific, and I never asked God before. See, that's the thing about God. Come on now. This is something that we miss. It's in the Bible. Write it down and make it plain. He will give us the plan and the purpose. It may not be according to what you want or how you want, but you still need to ask. You have to have faith and you have to trust. You have to plant the seeds. Come on. You have to stay. And we need to understand that we're worthy to ask him. Yes. And if it's meant, he will deliver. 
And so I wrote it down about the man that I needed and I wanted this. So three months later, I met my husband and, and I, we, I, I went online for the first time. I'm not embarrassed to say I've never been online. A friend of mine did it. And he reached out like for three weeks and I wouldn't reach out. Finally, I did and got on the phone and I'm like, hello. And, and he had this accent and I'm like, where are you from? He said, I'm from Jamaica. I hey. said, what? What? And so, you know, we met up and then one day I had my list and I was asking him, but he never saw the list. I was asking some questions and he would respond. And then I turned my list around and I said, here you are. This is my list. Here you are. And we got married in 2011 and we're still married today. Amen. And he can cook too. I never, I had to take I had to take me a big old plate of that stuff home. I felt a little embarrassed. I, you know, and then I was trying to get some more of that catfish, but it was all gone too. I do know what love is, and, and that could be a separate conversation about okay. the marriage piece. But this broken woman that thought that men weren't about nothing but to get what you need and they weren't supposed to love you, learned to love somebody, and I've been married since. And um, I'm thankful and I'm grateful. And again, if you see all that that was building me up, all those storms that I had to go through wow. to get to where I'm at today. But in 2010, because I met my husband, 2009, he didn't know at first that I ran a foster home either. He saw my nieces and nephews, my kids, and he saw them and how we interact. And then one day, like three months later, I said, I'm a foster mom. He said, there's no way. I know what foster homes look like on TV and I know what the people went through. And this, this can't be. And I said, this is a foster home. He's like, I had no idea. I know I didn't. I yeah, mean, I really didn't, didn't until you know. just told me now. Yeah. I've been I over usually... there to everything. I didn't know there was a foster care. I didn't know it was the, now kids. I didn't know anything. I would like for you to also get into because your victories is what I'm trying to get into. You know, okay. we, we get down, but you got up. And yes. if you had something to say to someone that may have came from an abusive background, family with drugs and all of that, or, where they had to run around and run away and all that kind of stuff, when you didn't think of yourself, is there something you could probably tell someone that may be in a situation like that or thinking like that, can you leave something with them today? I would love to because there's a big part that's important that I want to somehow go back to if we can because we can. I can relate to having a parent that's a substance abuse user. I can relate to having a relationship with a mom that was strained. I can relate to being a young mom and having to struggle. I can relate to um, not understanding what love is and how going through different broken relationships can mess you up. I can relate that there's a victory that you can love. And there are at least there are people that are healthy and that are out there to be with you and work with you, that you can be successful in marriage, that you could start college and maybe if you're not ready, not finish, but you can always go back and get your degree later. I can relate to a lot of that. So what I can tell people that get stuck is don't give up. Surrender yourself. Pray about these things. Know that God made each and every one of us individually. He did not make no mistakes when he made us and that we all have a purpose. But we have to go through obstacles sometimes to learn the purpose so that he can use us to be a vessel and help other people. That's what we have to know. We cannot give up. Ten toes down. You have to stay strong and solid because if you fall, the enemy wins. But if we stand and trust God, we will win too. And we can become victorious. I want to go back about my son, about this kid that saved my life, but he also broke my life. And I want to talk about the son that I fought and did everything for, put me in a form of self-destruction that I thought I was going to die. So I kept my son. I want to go back. We were doing sports. We had the kids. I was a strict mom. Again, like I said, my own trauma. I was very strict on my son. He was a boy. I'm a mom trying to raise him. And I disciplined my son. And when he got about 11 and a half, 12, 
I used to spank my son. Even though I had a foster home, I would take my son to his room and I'm disciplining my son because you're mine. You don't have a GAO. You don't have no casework. You don't have no system. It's me because if you get out there, it's me. So you're going to follow my rules and you're going to obey. So one day I spanked him and um, he said, I'm going to go to Texas to live with my father. Well, I've never been one of those moms to keep your kid from your father. Those are games that are childish and you can't do that because that's not right. The kids deserve to know both parents unless that parent was detrimental detrimental to that child. So I told my son, okay, you want to go be with your father, but you're not coming back when you get mad at him. We're not playing teeter-totter. You're going to go with him. It's the biggest mistake you made. Go on. Is this what you want? Go. So I called the dad and I said, you know, you haven't paid no child support, which is your business. But I'm not paying none. Arthur's coming, but he won't be able to come back here. I'm not playing that because what we're going to do, if you allow that, we'll make him learn that he, whenever he doesn't get his way, he can run. That's not a good example. So I'm still a foster mom. And my son was down there and he would come for the summer. And um, when my son was a senior in high school um, in Texas, I was working on my first master's degree and I was writing a thesis paper. And my son's grandmother called me and she said, Ayana, um, have you talked to Big Arthur? And I'm like, no, why? And she said to me, the sheriffs are looking for Arthur, my son. And I said, what? I said, find my son because y'all are in Texas and I don't want them to kill my child. Find my son. Well, later on that night, my son made it to the news where my son um, did a robbery at 17 years old, and he set up a guy with an iPhone and him and his friend, and they said they were going to buy the iPhone. They robbed the man, beat him up, and they near left the man for dead. And they made the news, and my son the next day was arrested. Bill, I would have thought that someone took a bat to my legs and broke them off to the mm. to the quick. And I fell. I was sick. And I was scared. And I said, how did this happen? I've raised all these kids and none of them ever got in trouble. I gave them to his father. And now I'm getting a call that he's looking at zero to 99 years in the penitentiary. I had to go to Texas. I went down there for his first hearing and begged the judge. You know, I took my foster care thing and my license and, and I'm in school and, and, and I'm married and all this. Can we just have him and we'll bring him back for court? Can we, He's never had a juvenile ticket. He's never been in trouble. And they denied that. No. You need $50,000 for his bail. Instead of him getting a public defender, I paid for him to have a lawyer because he's looking at zero to 99. And I got into a depression. And I got into a real dark place. Thank God the teacher let me have an extension of two weeks. I wrote my thesis paper and I got my master's degree in that storm. I got the degree. God, again. But in the meantime, I lost myself. My husband was here with my kids, so he was able to help, and I started drinking. And I started drinking. And I started drinking. And before you know it, he served six and a half years in prison, which if you're a parent that had a child in prison, that's a nightmare because you, you can't sleep a sleepless night. Because when they're in jail, we're in jail serving with them. We serve time with our loved ones that are in the penitentiary because you don't know if they're gonna get hurt. You don't know if they're gonna get raped. You don't know if they're gonna get killed, shanked. You gotta make sure you have money on the phone. You gotta make sure you have money on the books. You gotta make sure you have money to fly down there to see them in their visits so they're not left alone. You gotta make sure that the J pays and everything is up to correct so it's financially expensive as well on top of lawyer fees. And I lost myself and I started drinking and um, I developed uh, an alcohol issue. And maybe like six years ago, five years ago, maybe, it got to the point where my family was concerned, my husband was concerned. I became concerned and I had to go into therapy. So I did three and a half years of intense therapy, going back to that girl 
going back to my childhood trauma, going back to the things I witnessed with my father, going back to a place where I was victimized at 11. And all that was processed to the point I was able to bring my mom in therapy. Me and my mom haven't had an argument in three and a half years Praise because God. she was able to come in one of those sessions and apologize Praise God. for what she did and sent me through. And I remember looking at her at my 45 years old self and said, you made me wait till I was 45 years old to tell me you were sorry and you didn't know that you gave me to a monster. And if you would have known, you wouldn't have did it. I've been angry at you for all this time. And you told me, sorry, the weight just pulled off my shoulders. And my ability to forgive my mom became real. And to let go of the rage was released. And I became healed through that. So by my third, by my fourth year in therapy, I decided I have these two master's degrees. I have a bachelor's degree, but God, you ain't done. So I went to school to become a certified addiction specialist and I'm licensed and certified right now. And because I've been in recovery myself and able to overcome, I'm able to help people. And I'm here to help them get their peace, to deal with their trauma if they want, to address their struggles so they don't have to self-medicate to be whole and that they can live a life of freedom too. And that's what God gave me, peace and freedom. So he never left me. He never so I left. So I lot of storms. No, I left him. You really didn't probably even, did you know him really? I always knew him, but I don't you know him. You knew of him. You heard the word, him. all that kind of stuff, but he hadn't really manifested in your life. No, but he's there now. Come on now. And he's been there and I do use him. I mean, because I can even give you an example. The other day I was dealing with work and getting some things together and I was panicking and I stopped and I said, fear is of Satan. Faith is of God. You are lying to me. I have nothing to be afraid of. I have nothing to be worried about. I take this anxiety and release it to God, take it away because under him, there's nothing I have to worry about. And I did some deep breathing and I released whatever that anxiety was and it was gone because I gave it back to God and sent that, that fear to the, to the enemy and say, you can keep it. But I serve a God that I know loves me and he doesn't want me to be anxious for nothing. Amen. No. Amen. No. Amen. And that's the things I have to use because I'm still human, Bill. Yes, we I are. And we still go through things. But now I know I can go through things with God's help so I don't have to be in bondage. I could be free and know how to have a mind to have clarity when you're sober and when you're peace and when you're free and trust God. We could do anything. But what I would like to do, Ayana, mm -hmm. um, is just collaborate with you and just say, uh, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for Ayana. I thank you for her testimony. I thank you for her life. I thank you for the way that she just followed and obeyed you. Heavenly Father, so many children and people, we need souls like Ayana. We thank you for for being her footsteps in the sand, Father, for carrying her when she didn't even know you, heard of you, but didn't know you. And we thank you for your amazing healing power. And dear Father, I pray that you continue to open up her mind for all the people that she has helped and all the children that she's helping as of today. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Addiction is addiction, and you still have to approach it the same way. It starts with a trauma. It starts with unresolved issues. I really okay. thank you for your time. I do want to get back with you. Uh, okay. I thank you, my sister. I thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. You're so welcome, Bill. Well, another episode of Where Were You? And we would like to thank our guests for this evening. Also want to thank New Me. New Me helps sponsor Where Were You? So go on and check it out. New Me forward slash Arcway. Also, go on and hit that like. Go on and hit subscribe. 
Go on and hit that share. Go on and leave a comment. And if you find anyone that has a story, let me know. And hey, you bless someone today.